Right, today's uh, video is going to be an accompaniment to a blog post which I'm in the middle of writing, so hopefully it will have up by the time I edit and upload this, about the glaze that makes up these recipes. So you've got Borealis, which is the original, and then Glacier and the Nudity Purple, and I'll put um, edit still images in because it's much easier to, to show completely in focus on a still but um, these three are the same glaze base and um, it's one that I've been playing with for a little while I definitely haven't fully explored all of the colourant options for it um, but I decided that I've had enough playing with it on my own put the recipe out there and see what other people can come up with so I'm going to write all this in the blog post, so if you want to just skip to that and read it, you'll um, kind of get the full picture. Oh, and by the way, yes, this t-shirt is covered in my dog. Um, it's called Donny, if you want to see pictures of him, there are some as saved stories on Instagram. Uh, he's a Border Collie rescue. Uh, he's called Donny because he came he was rescued from somewhere in County Donegal in Ireland. Um, yeah, so basically the blog post will say all this, but I know some of you are more likely to see it on here than on the blog post or on Instagram, so I thought I'd, seeing as I was throwing anyway, I would stick up a video to go with it. And so basically, uh, the story behind the glaze is that it's building on some research that was done by another member of the class during the Ceramic Materials Workshop Advancing Glazes class I took last year. Um, and the really interesting thing that one of my classmates discovered was that chrome tin purples could be greatly improved by adding a small amount of titanium. So, for those of you that have not encountered them before, uh, a chrome tin purple is one of the most interesting colour responses you get in, I would say in any glaze, but certainly in oxidation. Um, and what you're doing is you're taking a pretty much universally green colourant, which is chrome, and adding it to an opacifier, sort of white colourant, which is tin. Um, and if you get the glaze chemistry right, they're quite fussy about chemistry. You get pinks, purples, reds, and so on. And those colours are notoriously hard to get anyway. Um, especially without reduction. So one way of getting red would be to fire copper and usually a bit of tin as well, but primarily copper in reduction. Um, and there are ways around that, like silicon carbide to artificially reduce copper in oxidation. But generally speaking, they're difficult colors to get. Um, and it's just one of those quirks where a very small amount of chrome combined with a decent amount of tin in a um, pretty much entirely calcium base with silica and alumina levels below a certain point and so on and so forth. You've got all these criteria but if you meet those criteria the tin will turn pink through to purple depending on how much tin and how much chrome you have. It's generally you get something in the region of 5% upwards of tin and around 0 0.01 to 0.2 maybe uh, chrome. So a lot of tin, not a lot of chrome. There are some kind of ideal ratios that people use but generally 5 and 0.1% is what I've seen crop up a lot. Um, I've used this before, some of you might have seen my recipes 
for, or, well, I say my recipes, you might have seen the recipes I shared for June Perry Purple, which is obviously uh, a June Perry recipe, not one of mine. And then I shared June Perry Pink, which isn't exactly uh, a June Perry recipe. But um, all I did there was I took the chrome out and I've got another a blog post on that and if you find it on glaze it will link but the idea behind that is that the tin is so sensitive to the chrome the chrome doesn't have to be in the glaze if the chrome is nearby the tin will still flash purple so you get sort of an atmospheric effect where the chrome that's volatilized and is floating around the kiln is enough to change the tin so you get kind of more colour on the side of the pot nearest and so on. It's quite an interesting effect. Um, all of that to say that um, what was discovered was that by adding 1% titanium to a glaze you could drop the tin from 5% to more like 1% to 2% and have a similarly bright colour whereas normally you'd have to have used the higher level. Uh, very useful as tin is one of the most expensive colorants up there with something like cobalt but with cobalt it's so powerful you don't need to use much of it so tins the most costly of the standard colorants um, so to use less of it is great um, and then titanium has some interesting effects on its own which is where you get the phase separation um, and the streakiness come from that. So in very briefly phase separation is just a glass within a glass, different phases of glass. So you'll get it when you have different glass formers. Um, so one of them, boron, will form its own glass within the glaze, as will um, Phosphorus is the other, I believe. So if you put bone ash, you'll get a different phase of glass. Um, but all of that's to say that you get an interesting glaze if you put titanium in it, generally speaking. Um, so adding titanium to a glaze like this would be interesting anyway, but to add it and then reduce the tin and still get the colour is great. So I was playing with that concept, took the I think I took my a slightly modified version of June Perry Purple and I just started playing with it. So I added the titanium, dropped the tin, um, and then started changing the silica and alumina levels. And my goal was to get the gradient between red and green that some succulents have, where there'd be green on the main body and red at the tips. And it was sort of I like well those are some of my favorite succulents I'll see if I can find a, a royalty free picture to post here if not I'll post a link in the description so you know exactly what I'm talking about but um, yeah, I'm not too big on my succulents because I tend to kill any plants that I have but um, some of the prettiest ones are the ones with bright colors and gradients and Moreover, the fact that it's chrome and tin, and it's the tin that turns purple, and the chrome is what does the green, means it's quite easy to get a gradient between the two of them. So essentially, you can cover a whole pot in a chrome recipe, that, as long as the base is um, suitable for chrome tin. And then anywhere you apply tin over the top of that will turn purple. So you'll get a green pot with purple, either a purple gradient or purple flashes, depending on how you apply the tin. Um, interesting concept, never really took it that far. I have some issues with June Perry Purple that I never fully resolved. Um, it has a tendency to blister in my experience. Um, and so part of what I was trying to resolve now that the research shows that you can add titanium and then increase the level of glass formers is could I make June Perry or a version of that 
starting from that point, could I make a chrome tin that um, behaved differently while keeping a bright colour? So that's where I set off from this with. Um, and then I tried one of the variations over my dark clay. Now the whole thing with this is 1% titanium. Titanium is both an opacifier and an effect additive because of the phase separation. So you add it if you want glazes to do interesting things, but you can also add it if you add enough of it you'll get an opaque glaze. 1% um, generally speaking isn't enough for that. Different bases will behave differently but 1% is very much at the low end. In the base that I am using it's um, enough that it's noticeably adding something but definitely doesn't make a solid colour. What it gives you is that streaky flowing um, whiteness that the uh, glacier has. Now the first one I tried was Borealis because I already had the chrome in it but and Glacier is just Borealis without the chrome. Um, but over the dark clay they are completely different to what I pictured but I much prefer them. So some of my favourite glazes really interesting movement and patterning all on their own. Um, they show off the colour well without, they're not bright bright, but they're reasonably bright given the clay that they're on. Um, so that's kind of where this started. And I had, <laughs> For a project that I had already started and abandoned, the getting them to look like a succulent project has been abandoned again in favour of playing with them over the dark clay. Um, and that's pretty much all there is to the story, apart from the fact that I did that collaboration, there's videos on here, but making the nudity special. And nudity, if you missed it, are a tea company um, here in the UK. Lovely people, and they make blends of... Um, so they, te they sell loose leaf tea, and then they sell it in blends and the blends are just some of the most delicious things you'll ever try. So if you're in any way interested in tea, check them out, I'll post a link. Uh, but I did a collaboration with them for their Christmas blend, which you can't get anymore on account of it not being Christmas. Um, so if you are checking them out, I would highly recommend After 8.30 and the new, I think it's called Cherry Kisses, but the cherry one. Those two are my favourite, but masala chai is great, the gingerbread chai is great. You can't go too far wrong. If you like the sound of it, uh, you'll like it. They're all, they're all really good. Anyway, their main colour is pink. So I knew this recipe because it started life as a chrome tin, pink slash purple, um, that it would be able to support a pink colour. And Unfortunately, we'd sort of left it a bit too late in the year to spend too long experimenting. But I had some mason stains lying around. So, stuck 5% mason 6000, which I can't remember. It might be shell pink, but anyway, I know the number 6000, so go on that. But I stuck 5% stain in it, and that was so good. I didn't actually end up changing that at all. That's um, what the recipe ended up being. So that's how I got the nudity colour. But having played with it since then, I reckon something like 1.5% tin will get you the same, broadly speaking, the same effect. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I haven't looked. You can sometimes figure out the stains from the SDS. Uh, I don't know exactly what will go into the mason stain. There might be a little bit of chrome, certainly I think in the, I've got some 6002 and that's got cobalt in it, which you can see if you put the stain into anything that runs a bit, the cobalt starts to make itself quite obvious. So it'll turn blue wherever it's thick because the cobalt 
separates out from the main stain. I don't know if 6,000 is anything like that. Um, so I don't think 1.5% tin is exactly right, but if you experiment with between 1 and 2% tin and the tiniest, tiniest touch of chrome, or none if you're firing it in the kiln with any chrome volatilized in it at all, because it's quite sensitive, and you'll start to get that flowing pink thick pink where, well, sorry, solid pink where it's thick uh, and then the clay shows through where it's thin but with a slight pink hue. So that's how I would suggest getting that one if you don't want to use stain and if you do want to use stain use Mason 6000 or probably any commercial Cone 6 pink. Um, but that's pretty much it for what I'm going to put in the blog post. I'll post the actual recipe below, but always best to find it on Glazy and save yourself a copy or add it to a bookmark or something. Um, just because Glazy is great for doing batch calculations and shows it in a really easy to view way, whereas when I'm trying to format it on a blog post, Squarespace makes it the layout look stupid. So. Um, one of those things, I will stick it in the blog, I will stick it in the, the notes for this video um, along with a link to Glazy uh, I would suggest Glazy but I think that's pretty much it, if you've got any comments about the glaze, it needs to be applied fairly thick and it will run um, well, it doesn't need the nice thing is it doesn't need to be applied thick, but you'll get a different effect because its um, appearance is based on thickness. So where it's thick, it'll be a solid colour. Where it's thin, it will be. Um, it doesn't actually phase separate at all if it's thin enough. So basically, you want to get to that middle ground or have variation between the two. If you just do a, a thin coat all over, it won't do much. But with a little bit more thickness, it will look like it should. Um, see my previous video on weighing your glaze on, which if you're not getting it to look the way you want to, then that might be something to consider, because it does need a certain thickness of application and it's easier to be consistent if you know what you're aiming for. But, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. So links in the thing, any questions let me know and I'll do my best to answer them. Um, if none of this made any sense but you would love to learn what I mean when I'm talking about all the chemical ingredients and why they are important and what they do, I got pretty much everything I know from a chemical point of view from Ceramic Materials Workshop. I'll post a link to them as well. Uh, fantastic courses, they're both lovely people as well, um, so I fully endorse them and think you should all go and take a course. If you're thinking about it, I highly recommend the full Understanding Glazes course, the one with the Hangouts and um, Labs over the uh, lectures only course but someone told me recently that you can do the lecture only course and then upgrade later so if you can't get on the full course and you can't wait uh, for it to become free because there's a limited number of slots and it's run every three months so you might have to wait a while before you can do it um, you could do the lectures only and then when you can get on the course I think possibly just pay the difference but I'm not certain about that um, definitely check with Matt before you commit to that just in case because it's it's not cheap but it is worth it um, and yeah that's it let me know if you've got any questions <laughs>